Welcome everyone uh, to our event uh, today. We have a full agenda, so um, I think we will be starting right on time. So I will be the moderator for today. I'll just start my PowerPoint presentation. It's just a little bit to structure the, uh, the event. So welcome again to our event on facilitating plan S uh, policy in, in your institution. Um, so why are we having uh, this event? Uh, plan S, Coalition S um, has been uh, going on for the last uh, couple of years and already since January, 2021, um, the policies are implemented, being implemented by the uh, 27 Coalition S organizations. And uh, since, you know, these are include uh, major funders on the national and international level, um, that is, of course, something that affects us as uh, RMAs and uh, EAMA. So we thought it would be a good idea um, to invite uh, some of the key people involved in Coalition S uh, to explain to us how it works. Um, just to note, um, in case you haven't seen the red uh, light uh, at this uh, Zoom event, uh, it is a recorded event and it will be available on the platform. So, you know, if you have any concerns about that, change your name, don't, uh, don't show your face, that's up to you, but which I just wanted to alert you to that. What are we doing today? Um, we will start with a general introduction to Plan S principles um, and, and your institution, but basically how Plan S works, what the principles are. We will then have a Q&A session for about 10 minutes, depending how we are with the timing, for some initial questions you might have. Um, and we are then going to move on and focus in part two on the rights retention strategy also focus then with another Q&A on this specific aspect. And last but not least, um, I'm going to say a little bit about where we are, um, because there has been the idea of an open science uh, group uh, floating around, you know, at the ARMA. So I will give an overview of where we are and some of our ideas of taking it forward. So the group doesn't exist yet, but we are in the, I would say, advanced planning stage. So who are our speakers today? Um, we have actually uh, a tandem of uh, two speakers. Uh, the first one is uh, Johan Roig, the executive director of uh, Coalition S, who also has a lot of experience of editor, as being editor in chief of uh, Diamond uh, Open Access Journal Glossa. Um, and uh, Sally Ramsey, um, the Coalition as Open Expert, Open Access Expert, and also an employee of JISC. And for myself, I have uh, two roles. I'm an independent consultant working on open science, but I'm also employed by the Ludwig Boltzmann Gesellschaft, uh, which is based in Vienna, Austria. So um, that's just a very short uh, introduction. And um, I would say let's uh, basically just jump into the content of the session. So um, I'm happy to pass on the floor to uh, Johan and Sally. Uh, thank you very much, Daniel, for inviting us. I'll share my screen now. Um, um, there it goes. Um, and uh, I'll start off right away with Coalition S and, and Plan S. 
Um, Coalition S, uh, first of all, is a, an organization of 27 organizations uh, worldwide, an alliance basically of national funders. Also, uh, the European Commission is on board with the Horizon Europe program. Uh, charitable foundations like the Wellcome Trust, Bill Melinda Gates Foundation, Howard Hughes Medical Institute, uh, and others. And there is a global dimension to Coalition S with the World Health Organization, Jordan, Zambia, and South Africa. Uh, we, to get, just to give an idea, we spend about $40 billion a year we, that are invested in research with an output of about 150,000 articles. Um, now, important to know is Plan S is not itself a policy. It's basically a set of 10 principles, plus guidance on implementation of those principles. Uh, the Coalition S funders who have gathered in Coalition S have uh, agreed to implement the 10 principles of Plan S in a coordinated way. And these, uh, these, the, uh, so these principles are implemented by a number of, of policies. And this, some of these we are going to touch upon today, but first we would uh, specifically like to highlight the one shot that Coalition S is after, namely that with effect from 2021, all scholarly publications must be published in open access uh, or uh, uh, in open access journals, platforms, whatever, or in repositories. Uh, without embargo. So it's about immediate and full open access. Uh, no embargoes uh, allowed from January 21 for, for, these, for these funders. Uh, the long and the short of it basically is that all peer-reviewed papers, so all papers that are peer-reviewed and that are the output of funded research by these organizations must be immediate open access with the CC BY license. And this basic idea is of course a company uh, by a number of uh, a number of uh, principles and a number of uh, policies that accompany them. Um, let's uh, quickly move to these these principles. Uh, principle one, uh, we will return to later. I think principle two uh, is Sally. Sally is going to speak to that, so I'll uh, hand over to her. Thank you, Johan. Yes, here I've highlighted the main elements of the principles. We're not going to cover the key themes for universities in our talk. <clears throat> the full list of the principles and the key themes and uh, the, the, uh, the suggestions for universities are going to be listed in a summary that will be distributed to you after this event. In the case of universities, principle two covers technical requirements for repositories. Thanks, Johan. So it's in the university's interest to provide an excellent repository service to securely curate the institutional crown jewels of research and to act as a shop window of that institution's research. And if um, funders permit, you can use funds to improve and maintain your service. So once your repository is registered in Open Door, the directory of open access repositories, you can monitor progress towards meeting the Plan S criteria. As administrators, I'm probably preaching to the converted regarding consistent metadata. Um, funder and organization ID are examples that will support your compliance and monitoring for research funders, as well as your internal processes. Um, the same is true of ORCIDs, which also directly assist authors too. It's also worth working on all these points with academics in your institution, those who run their own journals, to help them appreciate matters that some of them may not be already aware of. Thanks, Johan. Yeah. Then on to principle three. Uh, principle three is about uh, incentives to establish and support new services uh, that for open access infrastructures where necessary. So the idea is here that uh, since we are in a transition towards open access, there may be infrastructures that are not yet supported or not supported sufficiently, or there may be open access venues that still need to be built because uh, these, these are all still behind pay paywalls. Some of them are still behind paywalls. So what universities can do in this arena is build and improve the re institutional repository service and use funding if available, as Sally already said, because repositories is central to our rights retention strategy and to the fact that repositories can be used for green open access, which is part of our policies. 
Universities can also heavily promote diamond open access because diamond open access is scholar led and scholar driven uh, and uh, scholar owned as well. And this is something that universities can foster in order to uh, create a more equitable environment for open access publishing in specific areas and disciplines that lack these uh, that, that uh, lack these these services. I think it's also worthwhile for university administrators to familiarize themselves with the SPA Ops Toolkit. So the SPA Ops Toolkit is in fact a, a toolkit that allows um, um, uh, negotiators for universities and librarians to familiarize themselves with open access agreements for society publishers. So universities could also help societies, scholarly societies, if they are represented at the university, to move towards uh, towards open access publishing or negotiate deals with societies that uh, uh, move these societies' journals to, uh, to, to open access. Finally, again, uh, we would stress uh, engagement with local journal editors. It is our experience that universities do not necessarily know what open access activities and what journal editing activities are going on in their universities and it would be very very worth your while to have an overview of those such activities. Sally. Principle four is around open access publication fees that are covered by the funders and they shouldn't be covered by individual researchers. And it's key, of course, for Plan S that all researchers should be able to publish their work open access. Thank you. Johan, okay. Um, it's important that your researchers know how to find out if payment for their choice of publication venue is eligible for funding from their funder. And they can find that out easily using the journal checker tool that Coalition S has developed. They simply enter the details of their chosen journal, their funder and their institution, and the results clearly indicate their options. The URL is on the summary handout that you'll be sent. All researchers should retain their rights to their own work. We'll talk more about this later on. And all researchers should be aware of your institutional repository and know how to make use of it. Now, publishing charges vary um, enormously. It's therefore important that discussions take place across the institution as to how money can be spent fairly um, across all disciplines and all eligible researchers and include provision for any deals that might tie up large proportions of a limited budget. So, so some funders have what they call a block grant and some sort of fund directly. It sort of depends on which funder you're dealing with there. But nonetheless, I think this is a useful conversation to be had anyway within a university. And researchers and institutions may wish to use their budgets to actively include um, alert um, alternatives to the major players and to encourage diversity in both publishing venues and publishers. So funders may allow their money to be used for such purposes. Thanks, Ian. Thank you, Sally. Um, principle five is about uh, the diversity of business models. So uh, Coalition S has decided early on to observe business model neutrality. So basically, we, uh, so we, uh, we are neutral with respect to uh, commercial and non-commercial publishers, but we do, th we do think that open access publication fees must be commensurate with the publication services delivered and fees must be transparent. Uh, we want to know what we are paying for, what services are uh, delivered for the publication fee that, that we pay. And this is again, something that universities can play an important role in. Uh, for instance, by making researchers aware of the price of open access publishing, the fact that four nature articles uh, correspond to about a, the price for a postdoc for one year. Uh, but also you have to monitor things like public, uh, non-publication charges, such as page and color uh, charges that are really spurious in this day and age, because these are basically pictures that are um, handed on a platter to the publishers by the authors themselves. 
so what extra costs, it's not clear what extra costs they, they incur by, by publishing those. So there have to be more open discussions with we, we think about value for money. Uh, what does it cost to publish in this journal? What does it cost uh, to publish in, the, in another journal? And does that really, does that additional cost, is that really worth it? That is why we have built or we are in the process of building the journal comparison service, that's the JCS that's mentioned here, because we want to promote uh, transparency uh, with providers. We want to invite the publishers in their own interest, we believe, to share a breakdown of prices with us so that um, uh, librarians who negotiate these deals and uh, 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 consortia uh, negotiators can access these prices. Not everyone should be able to access the prices for competitive uh, purposes but so that they can access these prices and they can actually gain insight into, the in, into a comparison between the various journals to see what value for money we have. Also, we uh, think universities should uh, not only look at commercial publishers, but also be aware of alternative models, for instance, diamond journals. Very, very few people know that uh, the OAJ, the Directory of Open Access Journals, contains about 11,500 uh, diamond open access journals that do not charge authors for fees and do not charge readers for fees. So that's an important alternative, we think, to, commercial, to expensive commercial publishing. Finally, universities should consider supporting these alternative models. Uh, these alternative publication op options like SitePost, S2O, PCI, and the Open Library of Humanities that valiantly propose alternatives to uh, commercial publishing that do not rely on a per article fee for publication. Uh, Sally, principle six. Principle six is about aligning policies. Coalition S intended alignment with Plan S, and as we shall see later, many organizations across academia are increasingly walking in step with open research strategies and policies, putting researchers and the research they create and also wider society at the forefront of their thinking. So to this end, we suggest institutions, if they haven't done already, review all university strategies and policies relating to open science. To inform thinking, we suggest members of the institution are made aware of and also become familiar with key policies in the direction of travel of open science. So notable reports and position papers include those recently published by UNESCO and the European Universities Association. And here I've illustrated the EUA New University Open Access Checklist. We strongly recommend institutions adopt an institutional rights retention policy, of which more later. And then rather than working out how to meet publishers' terms and conditions for control of rights, we suggest universities look down the other end of the telescope and work out how best to protect and retain their authors' rights. Make um, a general shift from the thinking of assume closed what can be made open to the opposite, assume everything will be open and what do we need to protect is quite a useful um, flip of, of thinking. And you could join the increasing numbers of institutions, including funders that are adopting and implementing DORA or other standard um, uh, standards for research assessment and evaluation. And again, more on this later. Now, universities can be slow to change. I know I've worked in universities and can also be very risk averse. Uh, thereby limiting their ability to keep up with innovations and new practice. We'd like to recommend you join the many institutions taking bold steps towards open science. Of course, many of you will already have done this uh, um, in your institution, but for those of you that just need to uh, perhaps get a little bit more courage. <laughs> Johan. Thank you, Sam. Um, Principle seven is about books. Um, open access uh, also applies to academic books, of course, but there we have uh, acknowledged in the principles that the process will take longer. Um, and we recommend that you look at the five recommendations that we have formulated for OA books uh, from uh, of September uh, 21. In those five recommendations, we, we, uh, we explicitly say that we will support um, uh, that we recommend uh, books uh, 
contributions for books to be paid by the funders. Uh, we recommend CC licenses, but not necessarily CC by only. We, uh, uh, but it's very clear that the, uh, the, 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 the funders policies with respect to open access book will converge more in, in future. Um, what universities can do in this space is to encourage or mandate openness across all types of outputs, so uh, not just articles, but definitely also books, uh, and have a conversation with their authors about it. Uh, especially in books, I, I notice myself that um, authors who are uh, very avid uh, open access, even diamond open access advocates uh, will, will still publish with the prestigious publishers their, their books in not, not in open access. So there's really, there's really seems to be some double thing going on there. Um, uh, so, so that really needs our support. I think uh, universities can also ensure support services and information about it, uh, about other outputs uh, than books, uh, data, open data, preprints and, and so on. And they should work closely with libraries in order to, uh, in, in order to enable these policies because libraries uh, know a lot about uh, open access and about these, these issues and could really be of crucial help in reaching out to researchers and make that change, which is basically a change of mentality uh, more than anything else. So they really also should keep uh, researchers informed of opportunities for funding, for instance, for make opportunities for making long form publications open, new universities, funding for OA books. Uh, UKRI has set aside a specific sum for open access books, so that is something that uh, you should uh, be looking into, I believe. But we really have to, you really can promote open access for all sorts of outputs and not just the peer reviewed articles. Uh, I think that's very important to stress. Sally, principle eight. Coalition S funders state categorically that they will not support um, publication in subscription journals that offer an open access option. They're commonly called hybrid journals. There's a detailed piece on the Coalition S website that states the many reasons for this. However, they may contribute financially to business models that are described as transformative arrangements towards a full open access environment. Thanks, Johan. No, oh, sorry. Yes. It's usually the libraries that manage the institution's relationship and payments to publishers. Library staff are invariably hugely knowledgeable and savvy about publishers' business models, prices, deals and terms and conditions, and we strongly recommend that you liaise closely with your libraries. Budgets can quickly become soaked up by payment for big deals. It's worth thinking creatively about how to ensure diversity of publication options. Although some publishers would have you believe their way of working is the only one that's going to ensure the survival of academic publishing, the world is moving on rapidly. And as we shall see later, academia is beginning to take back control of scholarly research dissemination. So keep your horizons broad. The overinflated prices and hugely profitable businesses that form scholarly publishing are well documented. Don't be afraid to push for more affordable prices, for more acceptable terms and conditions, and for transparency in pricing, as Johan has already mentioned. This works especially well when joining forces within negotiating consortia, so sort of strength in numbers. Authors are no longer bound to publish in a traditional journal. It may surprise some of you. Um, once flaky metrics such as impact factor are dropped um, and as supposed indicators of quality, authors realize that there are many innovative and scholar driven alternatives available to them. This will include making more use of your institutional and other repositories as well as options such as preprint servers and overlay peer review. Thanks, Johan. Thank you, Sally. Yes, principle nine is about monitoring compliance and, and sanctions, what universities can do there, uh, because uh, coalition SR funders, of course, will monitor how this policy is implemented. And if uh, authors, if funded researchers do not comply with this, they may take appropriate sanctions each in their own 
uh, jurisdictions such as no longer providing funding to uh, authors who blatantly disregard these uh, these uh, policies and their uh, contracts. Uh, so it, it is very important. Universities have a key role there in in, in alerting researchers researchers to their open access uh, commitment. Now, very often it is the university that signs uh, the, the, the contract with uh, the funder rather than the researcher themselves. So universities have a key responsibility there. So it is very important that all collaborators in a project, we, which may or may not belong to the same university, that they are all aware about their commitments, about the open access commitments that are the conditions of the grant, uh, also provide simple procedures and clear information, work closely with libraries, also work closely with the funders. Uh, the, in the, the, the different funders have very clear policies, they can be contacted about this. If anything is unclear, contact them. Also raise awareness of the journal checker tool. I think the journal checker tool is a great resource to find journals that are compliant with Plan S and with the policies that we are pursuing and that afford open access in a in a way that is compliant with the funder policies. Uh, also very important is uh, do not tolerate pushback from third parties and with third parties here we mean mainly the publisher who cause uh, compliance difficulties for researchers. We will talk about that later. Uh, you should not hesitate to involve legal services. We already know that in the UK, a number of universities have, have done that in, in, in specific cases. Um, so also to, uh, to, towards researchers, uh, it is important to promote the benefits, the many benefits of, of compliance, the many benefits of open access. Many researchers do not know, for instance, that if they publish in open access, their research will be much more widely read. Uh, the figures are clear there has been a lot of research showing that open access publication provides uh, authors with a lot more readership uh, all over the world and that is uh, what researchers are after after all huh? impact the impact by being read by various people so i'll hand over to sunny again for principle 10. Well, finally principle 10 as i mentioned earlier Many so-called measurements of quality are becoming quite rightly increasingly unpopular. This includes not just metrics such as impact factor, but elements such as journal title. Plenty of dubious research has been published in what are often cited as top quality journals and by well-known publishers. And for evidence, I suggest you visit the Retraction Watch website, where I note that seven out of the 10 Currently, most highly cited retracted papers were published in the well-known journals, New England Journal of Medicine, The Lancet, Science, Nature and Blood. Coalition S funders are committed to not basing their funding decisions on prestige indicators. Each funder is taking its own steps, but as a group, Coalition S has published a statement on responsible research assessment and evaluation. The statement includes this graphic of examples in principle 10 in practice, the before and after of implementing such a practice. It illustrates moving from measures of prestige and quality, qualitative metrics to reproducible research and the intrinsic merit of the research, not how you measure it. Thanks, Johan. Please take a look at the Coalition S statement on responsible research assessment and evaluation and explore how you can align your strategies, policies and practices towards responsible and reproducible research and move away from prestige infested metrics. If you haven't already, consider implementing DORA or some other recognised means of ensuring research and researchers are judged in the most reliable and accurately informative way possible. And finally, we'd like to ask if you would be willing to publicise the Plan S impact survey to researchers, which aims to gather data from the research community about their publishing practices, experiences and impact, if any, of Plan, X, Plan S on career progression. Thanks, Johan. Thanks, Sally. Uh, this, this concludes our discussion of the, um, of the 
principles um, of coalitionness and how universities, what universities can do to, to bring those into practice and to support our policies and to complement them. So we are now open for questions uh, if you have any, haven't been able to follow the chat. That. So thank you very much. Uh, I think this was a very uh, comprehensive presentation, a lot of information in there. It was also interesting for me. I still learn new things, you know, and um, also Johan and, and Sally, I wanted to congratulate you also on, you know, being very responsive and uh, very proactive on, on uh, these open science issues, uh, especially about the research assessment. So I think this is really an important uh, point to take on board. So um, we have two options for our audience to interact uh, with you. The first one is uh, if you feel comfortable yeah, talking to the audience, um, you can just raise your hand and then I will call you and you can ask your question uh, if you want, of course, also with your camera on or if you feel more comfortable, uh, you can post the question in the chat and uh, I can read it out. Um, we have uh, at the moment in the chat, um, not a question, but more a comment uh, from uh, Giovanna from uh, Trinity. And uh, she basically uh, shared some information about a tool to support researchers in using uh, different metrics, the research impact factor framework, building audience focused evidence-based impact narrative. So I wasn't aware of that, but it also shows that um, really there's a lot going on now about impact and assessment. So just wanted to check uh, with the audience. We have now 41 uh, participants. Do you have any questions? Okay, there oh, is uh, now a long, uh, so Mariette just sends a long, quite a longish message in the, in the chat. Um, so basically she's saying in the chat about a survey where um, there was a question, maybe it's, she's referring to your survey, Johan and Sally, yeah, yeah. You're, you're nodding. Question three, a publisher asked you to sign a CTA or license to publish, what will you do? The advice was basically to not sign contracts that contradict each other because you will be preaching either one or the other. Either negotiate, ask for a waiver from the publisher, or find a different journal that does allow you to retain your rights. And this is apparently now the question. We wonder how this fits in with the RES, the rights retention strategy, which is presented as the first contractual obligation that cannot be overwritten by a later one, the CTA. This answer makes it sound like if the CTA conflicts with the right retention strategy, you cannot use the right retention strategy because you will be contradicting each other, breaching one of the contracts you signed. If this is true, in what cases can our researchers use the right retention strategy? So in a way, this question already is, uh, you know, preempting a little bit the second presentation. Do you already want to answer it or do you want to wait uh, for the second Q&A? Uh, I, I suggest we wait for the second Q&A because I think some of it will be answered and if the question still persists, we, we, will, we will answer right. it then. That's, it's okay. really a matter of sequence. I mean, the right, the right, since the right retention strategy always comes before, at least that's the intention, the CTA will always be later and will, come, will be in contradiction with the original uh, license. We will come, but we will come to that. Great, okay. So another new message. So I think people seem to like the chat. Uh, Katya, thank you very much for all your work. In your opinion, what is the best strategy to advocate an open science policy in the institution from a bottom-up perspective? Sally, that's for you. <laughs> <laughs> yes, I, I think um, from a, from a bottom-up perspective, but also from a top-down one, I think it's like a, a sort of pincer, a pincer approach. Um, I mean, I can I can only speak from my own experience here, and uh, each institution, of course, is different. But um, I think from a for an open science policy, it does you, you can't just come from one perspective. I think it needs to bring in 
not just the researchers, but um, research administrators like yourselves, but also um, the senior management um, of the university. And as we've been talking here, possibly your legal services department on certain aspects, you know, when you're looking at rights and licensing and particularly for things like data, you will need to get it very clear about, you know, what what rights live where. So I think, yes, it is a bottom up perspective and um, possibly, well, certainly go through your library because they will be involved in a lot of aspect of this. But also when you're looking at open science, I mean, it's so broad. Um, I was involved at Oxford with, with the um, UK reproducibility people, and that initiative has now spread across a lot of countries. And so you've got a lot of researchers themselves doing a lot of the open science support, ideas, uh, discussions, help for early career researchers and so on. So the, the reproducibility network, I think, is somewhere to um, tap into. There are web pages and, and I can send links if you want them later on. If, if you want to contact me, I'm quite happy to, to um, come back to you with those. So I think, yes, approach through all channels would be would be my view on this. But if, if, if you want uh, one that really sticks out, for, for me at least, I think, uh, the, the, and that is both from bottom up and from top down, it is the rights retention strategy that we will talk about. Because we, we believe that the best open access uh, that you can do is the one by which you do not give away your, your rights to the paper. And that is an individual responsibility of the researcher to assert a CC by license on their papers as soon as they are written, so to speak, because that becomes inherent in the paper. And also um, institutions should have a rights retention policy in order to protect their researchers against uh, the publisher so that the researcher does not feel alone in uh, their stance towards the publisher, who is, after all, a very intimidating entity. And that's a very um, costless uh, policy, so to speak. It doesn't cost you anything to institute the rights retention strategy uh, or policy. I mean, UK, a number of institutions have already done it, notably Edinburgh, uh, Birkbeck, and uh, lastly, uh, Cambridge. And this is really something where the university can really make an assertion that, you know, the work that is done in the university belongs to the workers in the university, uh, belongs to the university, and should not be given away, should not be signed away by individual researchers to, to the publishers. Um, it, so it's to assert ownership on your own production. That I think is the, the but we will come to talk about, we will be maybe, talking maybe about we it. Should, yeah. we should crack on with the second part. <laughs> <laughs> oh, there's another question. Otherwise we are giving everything so we away. Got, uh, <laughs> we got another question here. I'm just reading it out, even though you can see. Um, until the prestige metrics drop for real, how to convince researchers to publish in diamond journals, even for free, many of them will refuse it. Did you, that, did you have that experience back in your institutions? Um, I think, well, I mean, I, it was coming to the fore in, when I was working at Oxford, and in fact, it was a researcher who first raised it with me saying, why aren't we doing more to, to disseminate information about, um, about diamond <laughs> journals? So I think that's, that it's quite interesting that it came from that uh, perspective. Um, I mean, clearly it's up to uh, the researcher where they choose to publish. But when money is involved, it's also up to who's paying and where the money comes from. So I think, you know, that can sort of that, that can sort of help the conversation along. Yes, I well, I mean, I, in, 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 in that regard, I think it's important that we raise the profile of Diamond Journals. And how do we raise the profile of Diamond Journals by publishing our best research there? Right. I mean, we have already stated as funders that we are no longer looking at the prestige of a publisher or the prestige of a journal title and, and the impact factor. So basically, there's no reason anymore to publish in those prestige journals. I mean, this is a relic from the past. Uh, I think we should collectively invest in uh, diamond journals because they are uh, community led and owned and, you know, academic led and owned. So this is something that we can take back and, and, and do, do ourselves. There are now 
many uh, open access venues that, that are available. People don't always see them because, of course, differently from a commercial publisher, diamond publisher do not have a budget for uh, promotion and uh, yeah, and dissemination of their, their activities. But they are out there. There's, they're often very good. Their quality assurance process are often just as good as the that of the major publishers. So check it out. I mean, there's the, the like I said, there's the OHJ. Um, in the OHJ, about 11,000 journals are open access. I mean, it's very likely that there's one in your uh, in your area that is uh, uh, considered a, a good alternative for uh, the the commercial uh, prestige journal. Thank you very much. Um, uh, there's one comment more on the research assessment and how important it is to change that. And I know I would certainly agree with that. And uh, I think we are quite lucky that, uh, or not lucky, I think it's a, it's a good sign that um, this is starting to take hold with the activities of the French presidency and so on. And indeed that is fundamental. Um, I think we will be needing to move on to the rights retention strategy. We can take the last question also uh, from Giovanna next time uh, in the next Q and A. Just a final thing I want to add, because I remembered it when you were discussing uh, principle two and three, which are very much about the repositories, that now in Horizon Europe, we have this requirement of a trusted repository having to be used. This is uh, something new from Horizon 2020 compared with Horizon 2020. And I think, you know, what you were saying in principle two and three, that there is indeed a need to invest in university uh, in, in repository infrastructure. This very nicely connects also um, that nowadays in Horizon Europe, it's uh, basically not just uh, appropriate to use any repository, but it has to have some quality, uh, minimum quality requirements. So that was uh, my comment. And now I think it's, uh, it's about time that we move on to the rights retention strategy. Yes, um, I will. I will be talking about that a little bit, um, or yes, about rights retention strategy. As you probably know, uh, Coalition S has three routes to compliance. Route number one is gold open, gold and diamond open access journals, and funders may uh, pay for those. That, that's the first route. The third route is the journals that are under transformative agreements. So those are journals that are being paid for by uh, the libraries um, in transformative deals, read and publish deals that allow uh, authors who fall under that deal, who are part of that library consortium, uh, where authors can publish for free because the library has already paid for it. But today we would like to uh, focus on round two, which is the so-called green route. So what do we do with subscription journals? Now, very important. Uh, all coalition as uh, authors are allowed to publish in uh, subscription journals. That is not the problem. We do not exclude any venue for publication. Mm -hmm. uh, but uh, the, this, this, uh, this permission comes with a, a condition. Namely, the condition is that either the version of record or the author except the manuscript has to ma be made available in a repository. Uh, repositor in a trusted repository, as Daniel said, but we are in contact with the uh, Confederation of Open Access Repositories for that purpose. And there's also many initiatives going on to improve uh, repositories at universities. So there's again something that you can uh, look into. There's the uh, core CORE project that uh, does uh, this kind of this kind of work. Now it is very clear that for this for this route, route two subscription journals, the coalition S does not. Uh, uh, provide payment because, of course, it, the subscription is already paying for the for the journal. But we do ask that authors, uh, before the article disappears behind behind the paywall, that also share their AAM author accepted manuscript, at least the author accepted manuscript, in a repository. So, how um, uh, can uh, we do that? Uh, this is linked to our principle one, um, namely. Um, the, uh, that authors uh, should retain copyright, uh, that they should publish under an open license and preferably the, the CC BY license. Uh, the idea is uh, that, I, well, as I just uh, said a moment ago, what uh, Simon Baines has said, namely the best way to achieve open access is by never giving away uh, our rights to it. That is the, that is the idea. Uh, if we keep our rights, nobody can, nobody can take them away from us. So, 
Sally, do, do you want to speak to this uh, okay, aspect yeah. or shall this, this is just uh, two, two quick questions on copyright ownership. First of all, who owns the original copyright in the content of the researcher's research article? And it's the author. If you weren't aware of that, it automatically goes to the author. And I think that's right in all jurisdictions. Um, please correct me if I'm wrong there. And they don't have to do anything in order to claim that copyright. It's automatically theirs. Then question two, if the author signs a license to publish their research article, that's a, a license with the with the publisher. Can the author control the use of the content of the article? Well, the U I've taken uh, the information here from the UK Intellectual Property Office, which states there that as the copyright owner, it's for that copyright owner to decide how and whether to license the use of their work. And you can decide how your work is used. Uh, thanks, Johan. Yes. And, the, and uh, yes, go ahead. Sam. I was going to say, if you go to the next slide, but in practice, this is what happens. And an author is, is um, presented with either a copyright transfer agreement or um, usually an exclusive license to publish. And it includes the, that permission that the publisher legally needs um, to publish it, but usually also includes restrictions on how the author is allowed to use their own work. Um, what our experience shows is that many authors sign this, these agreements, and um, I have to say that from experience, an awful lot of them do not even read it, but they sign their rights away. And in this way, the publisher has taken control of rights to that work. I've put a couple of, um, of examples here from um, Wiley, big publisher Wiley. There, they, they actually, in, this, in the copyright transfer agreement and the license to publish, they call the contributor, um, they use the term contributor for the author, who's actually the license holder and the rights holder, and the, the owner here is Wiley. So even the language that's used, you know, it's, it's the publisher that's taking this owner, this over. And you can see there that by doing this, even if the, um, the author still owns the copyright, the publisher has taken hold of those rights from the author. I'll hand back over to you, Johan. Okay, thank you, Sunny. So back to the rights retention strategy, basically the idea of the rights retention strategy is to enable this green open access policy this to enable this policy where we ask authors to deposit a copy of the author accepted manuscript into a repository and the rights retention strategy makes sure that you have a legal right to do that um, so it's based on a sim very simple principle we already touched upon it namely that the peer-reviewed author accepted manuscript is the intellectual creation of authors and belongs to them it's as simple as that Right. I mean, you write the paper, it's yours because you wrote it. And um, to assert that ownership, the author, as the original copyright holder, simply has to apply a CC BY license to it. Uh, simply asserting that a, a CC BY license rests on that paper is enough to make that CC BY license inherent in the paper. It cannot be taken away by any subsequent agreement. So this is very important to know. If you don't do that, no, then you don't have that guarantee. So basically, this is about informing the publisher in some way or another, and we will come back to that, that uh, their publisher, I am submitting this paper to you, any version of my paper that will result from the peer review process, I claim a CC BY license on. The author accepted manuscript, the article that eventually results from my submission, is one on which a CC BY license rests. And that I inform you hereby of this license. This is what my, I assert my rights as a researcher. We believe very strongly that publishers do not have a right to own our papers anymore. That's, that's no longer necessary. Um, the uh, authors should re retain intellectual property rights. This is something that is also that is now part of many published, many uh, funders uh, policies, including the European Commission and UKRI. We believe that publication services should be paid for. There's no problem with paying for publication services. It costs money to publish. We agree on that, but not with the ownership of the AAM. Uh, we believe that funders and universities ensure that their researchers are not deprived of intellectual, uh, of essential intellectual property rights. This is a valuable asset, both uh, asset both for the researchers and for the the, the universities. Um, 
So um, the rights retention strategy has as its main objective that all research is, is with open access with a, a zero embargo and a CC by license. It empowers researchers to uh, retain their, their intellectual uh, property rights. That is very important. It also then, if you deposit that AAM in a repository, it allows global access uh, to that paper, to, the, to that version of the paper. And it is also eminently simple, in fact, because since you no longer have to take into account the rights that, that are different from publisher to publisher, basically there are no embargoes and the CC BY license allows you to sh share the AM in a repository, not only share it in a repository, but also, and this is very important, in fact, uh, for authors, they can freely reuse their own material as they see fit. Nowadays, it's very often the case that when you transfer your copyright uh, to, um, to the publisher, the author is not allowed to reuse graphs, uh, tables, uh, pictures, and so on from that with paper because the copyright has been transferred to the publisher. By asserting a CC BY license on the AAM, you can reuse any part of that paper as you see fit. Uh, and the same is true for other authors as long as proper acknowledgement is, is given. So the rights retention strategy with the CC BY license is a very powerful tool in the hands of researchers and they should use it, in our opinion. So we can compare this basically to payment for services. I mean, Im imagine the following, you pay decorators to, to decorate your house, strip wallpaper, sand, uh, undercoat, paint, and so on. But of course, uh, they are painting your house. Basically, painting the house is basically the same as, you know, doing the maintenance or doing the services that are necessary for your house to be, to, to look nice. This, this is the same service that, is, that the publisher provides in a sense to your initial manuscript. Uh, they have it reviewed, they have it inspected, uh, uh, they, they make it nice, they typeset it and they copy edit it, they make sure that all the references are okay. But in exchange, I mean, in the same way that you do not expect to hand, that, that, that you do not expect to hand over the keys to your property after the painting is done, you should not hand over the keys to your intellectual property to the publisher after the peer review process has ended. It just makes no sense. That's why we are making this comparison. Huh? And nevertheless, it is true that where, where people would never sign over the rights to their house to a, to a painter, they happily sign away their rights with a copyright transfer agreement to the publisher. So this is the kind of mentality change that we need to, that we need to uh, affect, uh, I believe. Um, so the bottom line is that the um, ties the author um, uh, publishers um, have no right, have no input into the intellectual content of your contribution. They demand copyright fans for exclusive licenses, and they can use your work in any way they see fit. You have no no longer any right uh, to, to to that work. By contrast, the author, in our view, is the author is the uh, the author and the original copyright holder. Uh, they are severely limited in what they can do, and uh, they often have to beg the publisher to reuse uh, parts of their own work. This this makes no sense. This and this is what we want to penetrate everyone on. This is something. This is something that makes no sense, and we have, we can change it very simply by using the rights retention strategy. So what authors need to do is the following: to apply the rights retention three simple steps. They need to inform the publishers that they are using the rights retention strategy. For instance, they can include in their in a footnote or in the letter to the publisher the following phrase: the research was funded by this organization. And the CC BY license is applied to the AAM arising from this submission in according with the grants open access conditions. You can even do this when you are not uh, supported by a coalition as funded. You, and anyone can say in a footnote, I apply a CC BY license to the AAM arising from this submission, period. That, that's your right. On publication, if the author accepts that, if the publisher accepts that, which is a big if, which we will come back to in a minute, um, the, uh, the author then can make the AAM open access in a repository. And in case of uh, uh, disagreement with the publisher, which could happen, as we will come back to, they can uh, contact their funder to, 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 um, to see what, what, they can, what, what they can do in order to solve the, 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 the potential conflict with uh, the publisher. Now, uh, publishers have used, uh, uh, we have 
contacted in 2020. We contacted all the publishers um, that most of our uh, researchers publish with and informed them that this change was coming and said, look, I mean, we are going to do the rights retention strategy. Be aware of this change. Our authors will be uh, allowed to use that rights retention strategy and assert their rights on the AAM. This is, this, this is coming. We did not receive any uh, clear response that they would re be refusing uh, that they would be refusing manuscripts or submissions that 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 never happened uh, they were not happy uh, about it i mean they uh, did the usual amends that this would uh, be the end of uh, the publishing industry as as we know it but in fact what we uh, did find is that a few months after they uh, were using what we call what we could call guerrilla tactics or smoke and mirrors in order to thwart the rights retention strategy. So for instance, they were saying things like, you cannot use the rights retention statement when submitting to the journal. Well, of course you can. It's your right as an author to use the rights retention strategy. The only, um, the only option for a journal is to say, no, we will not accept articles with the rights retention strategy. And to our knowledge, there is only two journals, Blood Advances and another journal by that publisher that refuse articles with the uh, rights retention strategy. So there, of the thousands of publishers out there, there's exactly two journals that refuse the rights retention strategy. Um, they will also say, publishers will also say things like, before proceeding with the submission, you must agree to an APC for publication. Well, that's not true. The rights retention strategy and the, the APC are completely independent. Uh, and of course, by saying that the publisher is suggesting that you enter into an agreement. So if you say, well, they will say, well, okay, we will accept your uh, RRS, but you will have to pay. Well, that, those two are independent. That uh, you are perfectly within your rights to publish with, with, uh, behind the paywall, not paying the, for the APC, and at the same time, uh, deposit the AAM in, in a repository. The most dangerous tactic is this is the third one, namely when the publisher asks you to sign a separate contract, because then we are in the realm of contract law and contract law in uh, with this contract, the publisher might want to entice you to respect an embargo. The trouble with that uh, aspect is that the publisher uh, then asks you to sign a contract that uh, in which you agree to an embargo period, but that is in breach with uh, some of your grant conditions. Um, now, there is, a, there is a question whether this is even legal, because there is this, this notion that of procuring, uh, that is called procuring a breach of contract. Basically, the publisher is uh, enticing you to break a, a pre-existing contract. So it's very questionable whether this is even uh, allowed legally. But in any case, we would like to urge you here that, you know, this is something that uh, uh, authors should be especially aware of uh, because they would be in breach of their contract. Uh, you cannot have two contracts that contradict each other. And of course, the earlier contract with the, uh, with the funder should take precedence here. Um, so uh, the long and the short of this uh, story is that some publishers are knowingly putting authors uh, uh, wishing to use the rights retention st strategy in, in a difficult situation. These contracts can contradict the grant agreement and, that, uh, or, and the university and put the university and the author in a difficult position. Uh, sometimes even uh, uh, publishers suggest that they delete the rights retention uh, uh, language from the article that is really a, a amounts to a, a type of censorship. And sometimes also they will wait until acceptance to present the author with these conditions. So basically then, of course, the long process of peer review has happened. And then the, 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 the author is put into a corner where they either abandon the rights retention strategy or pay, or pay for a fee or are presented with a contract. We are the, of the opinion that publishers are perfectly within their rights to refuse and desk reject articles that come with the rights retention strategy. But they are not allowed to confuse, mislead, or trick authors into their into other grants agreements. And we have written a letter to 150 publishers asking them to be clear about these conditions at submission. Uh, predictably, we have not received uh, an answer to this this letter. Um, and now I will hand over to Sally again for the direction of travel travel going forward. So thanks, Johan. It's if you can. Click on, thanks. It's not just Coalition S funders who are frustrated by some publishers' efforts to confuse authors. 
Here's an example of an open letter from researchers organizations requesting that those publishers uh, I should re read it, reconsider their position and modernize, ensuring they play their part in providing fair and transparent conditions for authors. And there are other organizations requesting the same, including Eurodoc and the Marie Curie Alumni Association. Thanks, Johan. Last November, UNESCO published its recommendation on open science. In it, it states that any transfer or licensing of copyrights to third parties should not restrict the public's right to immediate open access to a scientific publication. Our Coalition S rights retention strategy predates this recommendation, but fulf fulfills this clause precisely. Thanks, Johan. Then we've got the opinion of the G6 group of institutions, which also concurs with that of Coalition S. They see a shift to fully open access as a priority, but know that handing over the rights to the content of publications hampers their researchers when sharing their work, what Johan alluded to earlier. They're therefore committed to support their researchers to retain, oh, go back, retain sufficient rights to publish their scholarly works openly and under an open license. And again, this directly matches the Coalition S view. Thanks, Johan. The European University Association, uh, which comprises over 850 universities and rectors associations across Europe, has publicly endorsed the Coalition S rights retention strategy. I've got a nice big heart on it there. <laughs> Thanks, Johan. And in its recently published Open Science Agenda, oh no, back, that one, that's right, uh, Agenda 2025, EUA clearly states that authors and institutions need to retain their intellectual property rights, for example, using Plan S rights retention strategy, and critically consider which stakeholders should own and run publishing infrastructure in order to create systemic change. EUA state stated that to make this a reality, it will advocate to reclaim academic ownership of scholarly communication and publishing and support the Coalition S rights retention strategy. And you can see that this direction of travel is becoming increasingly evident around the globe. Thanks, Johan. Under the French presidency of the Council of the EU, a ministerial position has been drafted that states that authors of publications or their institutions should retain sufficient intellectual property rights to ensure open access, broader dissemination, valorization, and reuse of research results. So authors of research papers should retain intellectual property over their work. And this reform of research assessment and open science is in direct alignment with the Coalition S rights retention strategy. Again, the draft text is being developed for research ministers to adopt as EU member state government's position on assessment reform and open science. And it will shape an agreement for stakeholders that's being drafted by university and funder groups under the coordination of the European Commission. Next, Johan. And then we come to part six, almost the final part, where we're looking at how academia is taking back control. Thank you. As a colleague at Birkbeck University of London said, rights retention specifically acknowledges not just the hard work but the ownership of the expression of ideas by researchers. This is why it's important for institutions as well as funders to help authors retain their rights. In 2008, Harvard's Faculty of Arts and Sciences, note faculty here, voted unanimously to give Harvard a non-exclusive, irrevocable right to distribute their scholarly articles for any non-commercial purpose a type of rights retention based policy. Now, what took off at Harvard 
with its unanimously faculty approved permissions based policy is extending across universities. And you can see there on the right, I know it's very small, but it's small for a purpose. It's a long list of institutions and it goes on bit down the bottom of that page who've now got similar policies to Harvard Faculty of Arts and Sciences. Uh, thanks, Johan. Next slide. Oh, that'd be good. Yes. The Arctic University of Norway published its new policy, and that came into effect from the 1st of January this year. The policy includes a rights retention aspect, and it says that for employees and students wishing to publish in academic publication channels that have subscription based access, UIT's infrastructure for self-archiving, known as Green OA, shall ensure, ensure open access to the academic literature. Thank you, Johan. A similar step has been taken at Edinburgh University. Members of that university have agreed to a rights retention policy to allow the University of Edinburgh researchers to make their journal articles and conference proceedings available on an open access basis as required by research funders under Plan S. Thanks, Johan. The University of Cambridge has initiated a similar policy by running a rights retention pilot that will inform their future policy. Now, we're aware of more institutional rights retention policies in the pipeline, certainly across the UK. And it's significant and signals that researchers and their institutions have had enough of critical rights to valuable assets being freely given away to their disadvantage. Thank you, Johan. So to assist researchers, institutions and their support staff, Coalition S is making resources available for anyone to use, and you can find them on the Coalition S website. There's a template wording for authors to use to request clarity on the publisher's position regarding that or, um, article submission and author rights at the outset, what Johan was talking about there, rather than leaving it um, for the author and all the reviewers to go through the process of peer review before finding out that the publisher demands their rights and putting the author and, as Johan said, the institution in a difficult situation. If the author doesn't use that, there's a second similar template to be used in the author's covering letter asking for clarity from the publisher. There's a short video about rights retention and there's also, you'll be thrilled to know, a quiz. And some of you may have attempted this quiz already and if not, you might like to give it a try after this presentation. I'll hand over to you at this point, Johan, for the final section. Sections. <laughs> Um, yes, for the final section, uh, principle one, um, again, uh, well, uh, we want authors to retain a copyright and publish under an open license, preferably a CC BY license. Key themes are copyright, open license and content ownership, challenges for researchers, content uh, and content. Uh, so what universities can do in this respect is, again, uh, work closely with their libraries, do not tolerate uh, pushback from third parties like publishers, um, and work with legal services. And in, in this sense, for instance, the notion of procuring a breach of contract could be interesting to evaluate with your legal services. Um, uh, raise awareness also of copyright and licensing with authors, make authors aware that, you know, uh, use this analogy with uh, the the, the 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 analogy of the the painting the house uh, and don't do not let them give away their rights to their public to, to their publications and make sure that they adopt an institutional copyrights and rights retention policy ensuring that rights remain with the authors so um a couple of take home messages perhaps uh, here um the uh, article content belongs to the author for them to, to, to do wish as they wish for the benefit of readers, institutions, and society in general. Rights retention strategy uh, helps authors retain their rights, and uh, at the same time, is a tool of compliance with the funder policy. 
uh, any, and we believe, as we have tried to show you, that an institutional rights retention policy is even more powerful because then the, the university steps in for the, the, the researcher. And while some publishers continue to deny authors their rights, key, key stakeholders can correct the state of affairs, funders, authors, and institutions themselves. So those are the key messages that we want to give. The last slide here gives an overview of uh, the various links that we will, will provide uh, after the uh, when we send you this this uh, uh, this uh, uh, presentation in, in the form of a PDF. And this is where I would like to stop and open uh, the presentation for uh, discussion. Daniel, over to you. Thank you very much. I had a um, couple of internet problems, um, but I was following, able to follow most of the presentation. It's very illuminating. Um, so thanks again. Uh, it seems like I just managed to get back the internet uh, now that you are finished. Um, so I saw that we have a few comments and questions uh, in the chat. We have about 10 minutes for Q&A, and then I'll finish with what we're doing at EARMA. I guess, um, Johan and Sally, um, you will send us the presentation afterwards, and then I can distribute it to the, to the participants. Um, I also made uh, some screenshots, and I might share a bit on Twitter, if that's OK for you, because I think it was very spot on on the need to uh, retain copyright. So we had uh, a comment from, or a question from uh, Giovanna, um, um, which I'm not sure you will be able to answer that um, because basically it's a question um, about the funding, uh, the submitting process when submitting uh, um, funding proposals to a funder that researchers are encouraged to name publications. Does Coalition S funder know uh, the publications that won't, require, that won't comply with the requirements. If they do, when they review the proposals, are funders flagging potential violations of these principles during the proposal review? Or how are these being approached by the project officers along the funding period? Also, experience has shown that this sometimes appears only as a compliance exercise rather than a learning process along the pro project reform researchers? I, I think there may be some confusion here. I mean, it's at, at a, there's a difference between application for funding and the, evalua the uh, evaluation of a funded program. So when a, a, when a program is closed off, is finished, then of course the, the program will be evaluated whether to see whether all publications are in open access that that is uh, 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 and then the relevant officers will of course encourage the <laughs> authors and the, the funded researchers to make sure that these these outputs are shared in open access in accordance with the contract so 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 that is just you know tidying tidying up the loose ends at the end of a project right so that's that's one thing that is something that every funder does as a function of their own remit. Uh, uh, when it comes to applications, uh, of course, funders will be uh, gratified to see that, so that publications are in open access. But I, I do not think that uh, to have all publications in open access is right now a, re an, a hard requirement for new applications. Of course, these uh, these publications that are in open access will be uh, uh, gr gratefully received and certainly evaluated uh, quite quite positively, but I don't think it's a it, it's a hard requirement uh, at uh, application, as far as I know. At least not that. I mean, maybe that some funders are doing that, but I'm not aware of it. At least. I mean, maybe so from my side, uh, my, my side to add, it might also depend whether you talk about, you know, with the, I mean, talking about the European funding, whether you talk about uh, a uh, mono beneficiary grant such as the ESC, Marie Curie, or one of these big, you know, uh, uh, consortia. So I know that uh, for the big consortia, the pillar two and 
two and three, mostly two, um, you do need to put in your application um, information about how you're going to comply with open access in the future if your project gets funded. Yes, that is, and, that is normal. But I think the question was the, the, the publications that you put forward to be evaluated. Yes. So when you yeah. say, yeah. well, that, there is that no would, requirement there that those all be yeah. in open access. Yeah. I mean, those so are mostly happens. relevant, right? Those are mostly relevant for the mono beneficiary grants. So for ESC, Marie Curie, there you, you want to see okay, what has the author published. And you know, it's, uh, I will come in a minute to uh, what we are going to do at the ARMA, but it might be interesting also to invite someone from the ESC maybe uh, to exactly answer that question because I'm also not so much familiar with these criteria for the mono beneficiary uh, grants. And certainly I can support what you said about this being checked after the project is over, right? Every project has to do reporting. And I, I do know from my time in the institutions that indeed the project officers, you know, do check whether the publications are available in the repository. Could I, uh, can I just add there as well, um, going back to the start of the question about um, knowing the publications that won't comply with, with um, funder requirements. I mean, you have to bear in mind here that a lot of publishers are being very, very, um, um, well, not open, shall we say. And um, they're, they're not stating categorically they will or they won't accept publications, but um, they, they may make a lot of noise about the rights retention strategy and how it's going to cause the downfall of all academic publishing as we know it. Well, we clearly know that that's not true. But we also know that a lot of, um, a lot of uh, publications have been made freely available in repositories using the rights retention strategy already. I mean, it's, it hasn't been going long, but um, Ross Mounds did some work on this a while back. And um, there are loads of, of um, articles in repositories with rights retention statements, and the publishers have not made a fuss about that. So they sort of are allowing it, but without saying, but we can't say categorically that they will. But they sort of are because, you know, they, they're dependent on authors to contribute good research to them to keep their, their journals going. So it's then they're not being clear and that's unfair. And, and so it makes it very difficult to say who will and won't. I mean, I also see that, you know, from the Austrian context, uh, um, when I look at what are the reactions of some Austrian universities, it seems that unfortunately, um, this, well, you could call it fear mongering from the publishers uh, has some effect, right? Mm. Because then university says, oh, we rather not do it because we might get sued by the publishers. And I, I don't think there's a single case where a publisher has sued a university. I mean, they have sued uh, platforms like ResearchGate. Uh, mm. uh, I think there's this one case, uh, yeah. But they haven't sued individual um, universities and even less individual researchers. Yeah, the, the ResearchGate one is interesting because, in fact, it was if you if you look at it strictly speaking with the letter of the law, it was the authors that broke their own <laughs> their own terms in doing that. But the publishers went for ResearchGate, not for the authors, because I mean it would create such a bad press. I won't say they will never do it, but wouldn't that create a bad press if a publisher? went for an author who was freely giving the content for the, the journals that the publisher publishes. So, you know, it, it, it's, a, it's a bit of a mess with what's happening, yes. Hmm. So we have a question from Ines um, about whether there is a formal or informal database of journals slash publishers that do not mind with the right retention strategy. So I guess it means that they are okay with it. Is there some database where we can find this information? Uh, no, it's a it's simple answer, answer, I think. No, we, don't, we don't have that. I mean, we we do, I mean, we may use the journal checker tool for this purpose in the future, but we haven't done that yet because it's a lot of work, of course. I mean, uh, also let not, not forget that no publishers, have, no publishers have, have explicitly told us that they refuse the rights retention strategy, right? I mean, there's only two journals actually that have informed us that they do. So that's two out of thousands of journals. So so it's it's a bit of it's a bit of a murky situation. I mean there are some publishers that state very explicitly that they will allow you to um, 
uh, deposit the AAM in a repository. For instance, Sage does that, and I think also the uh, Emerald also uh, makes that makes that statement explicitly. But I think it's very hard for us also to state very explicitly these are the RRS friendly publishers and these are the RRS less friendly publishers because you know it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a very hard call to make. So there's a but some input, of them are very explicit about it. There's an input discussion point from Maria Bellantone. I think it links a little bit to what we said already that the real rights retention strategy is not at all simple in practice. Founders and journals are in conflict, and basically it's the researcher that's uh, stuck in the middle. And then uh, she quotes a little bit from the statements that the uh, publisher put out that, you know, if this is required by a funder, then the researchers should select the gold open access route um, for offer selecting the subscription publication route, the journal standard licensing terms will need to be accepted, including self-archiving policies. Yeah, These yeah. licensing terms will supersede any other terms that the offer or any third party may assert. So basically, I mean, you know, from my side, this, this looks to me a little bit like the, the bluffing exercise yeah, that they are engaging with, mm -hmm. because she also says uh, uh, the option of a paper being refused without peer review because of the ROS is not something most authors want to face. But if I understood you correctly, there is no evidence that this has happened. Yeah? They might threaten to do that, but I, I, that was my understanding that it hasn't actually happened. Or is, is that uh, is that what's well, what we're, the situation is like? We're, we're not we're not a, aware of it if it has happened. And I think that this example here is a very nice one because basically what it's saying is we know your funder won't pay this APC, but what we're saying is we're making you the author choose the paid APC option and we're going to hold you liable or your institution liable for paying it. And so this is, it, it's got the, this, this particular publisher has got the, um, is, is now putting that author in a very, very tricky situation because if the author just ticks it without really understanding what they're, what they're signing up to, it means that they could be liable for a, a significant sum from that publisher because their funder has already stated that they won't pay it and the, the publisher knows that the publisher you know is doing something that they have full knowledge of but they're not explaining that to the to the author always mm -hmm. so we think that's really unfair and you know it's it's like it's what we've been trying to say and what um it's what eurodoc and the marie curie association and cesar and all of them are saying just give that author clarity at the beginning that you know at, right at the outset when they submit their paper are they going to be asked to pay for this you know is the or is the publisher going to refuse it because if they know that right at the start then you know it's easy peasy isn't it but if it's left until this late stage when you've gone through peer review it's then much more difficult to bail out your uh, yes, yeah, your thing yeah, I see that Maria also says, has there been any case of confrontation between a publisher and funder? Um, confidentially, yes. <laughs> of course, I mean, there are, there are funders who have been in contact with uh, publishers about, about such cases, and usually these have been resolved uh, um, in, a map, in a manner that is more or less satisfactory to, to, to the author. Uh, precisely because we have informed uh, the publishers about this. Uh, but of course, I mean, this is, these conflicts are not, or these conflicts, confrontations, as you call them, these confrontations are not something that we, that we advertise. These are relatively confidential conversations, but there have been such cases, yes. And, and it's and also- funders will back up their researchers. It's very important that you know this. Funders, funders will back up their researchers in this, at least if the researcher has done everything uh, correctly, namely announced that the rights with that CC by license rests on the AAM, uh, right? I mean, that is, that is you, you, you can't claim it afterwards. <laughs> I mean, you can not say, oh, I signed a, 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 a copyright transfer agreement first and I forgot to apply the IRS. Well, then you're in trouble. I mean, you know, I mean, we, the, 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 the funders did inform you that you need to apply this when you publish in certain type of journals. I mean, we have the journals checker tool for that purpose. But if, but if you do everything right, according to these policies, then um, then the funder will back you up with the, with the publisher. No, no question. And demand clarity uh, and demand a resolution. Yeah. 
And I'd, I'd just like to draw it back also to the um, what we've been talking about institutional policies, where you know the institution that the, the author has the backing of the of the agreement with their institution there, which actually is very powerful. So, so we would really like to appeal to all researchers on this call to talk to your university and ask them to back you up, ask them to institute a rights retention policy, because that is the best way for you to be to be secure, then you are backed up both by the funder and by your institution. And I would like to see the publisher who will take on both the funder and the, and the institution. That's never going to happen. I guess, you know, most of us, I mean, I don't know exactly where people are from, but they might be from a research support office, not really researchers themselves, but then I mean, it's my personal opinion. And, you know, in my one hat at the LDG, I'm also in one. Um, that, you know, it's also our role not to uncritically take over the argumentation of the publishers, right? But rather, we need to be informed ourselves what funders but, want, but what indeed, publishers I think, want, and I think administrators how can we help are even, researchers, you know, get out of the... I think administrators are even in a better position, I think, than researchers to, to, to plead for a, a rights retention policy in their institution. It's in their interest. It makes life a lot simpler down the road because, I mean... You know, all these researchers who come complain that they cannot comply with their funders policy. I mean, they are covered in one go. So this is, I think, really important to, to, to do. And we, we as coalition S would really very much look forward to institutions adopting the right retention strategy. I think Daniel is, uh, has, has problems with his internet connection again. Oh, there he is again. I will just keep on talking until then. No, that's okay. <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm still here. Um, I just, it's funny because, you know, the internet in the office is, and I'm in the office. I mean, that's not the real background. Um, it's, uh, it's worse than my internet at home. That's a bit uh, strange. I didn't expect that. Um, but I'm, I'm following most of it. And um, if there are no burning questions, I would actually do my short presentation about what we are doing at the AMA because we are, just about in time for that. So pray that the internet remains stable for this final presentation. Um, I'll just put on the, the, the presentation. So basically, um, I think, you know, this, this meeting here has given us a very good idea of um, the importance of open science also for us as research administrators and for IAMA. So uh, we are seeing all these trends towards open science and they're all interlocked with each other, right? We already discussed about uh, research assessment and how it fits with open access and open science and also open data. So um, at the IAMA, there has been a discussion going on whether to um, develop or set up our own open science group for IAMA members. Um, and we discussed that earlier over email, but we also had the possibility to discuss it in more detail at the recent EAMA conference in Norway. So here you can see a picture of our round table. Um, and the open science was also discussed in other sessions. We take as the uh, open science, you know, there are many different definitions, but we take uh, the the priorities, the ambitions that the commission has identified on the website in open science, we take that as a, as a starting point. And here are the eight ambitions, open fair data, European open science cloud, new generation metrics, future of scholarly communications, open access to publications, other outputs, rewards, research integrity, education skills, and citizen science that we take as the basis. And uh, we came up with a proposed remit, which hasn't been approved yet, it's just uh, in draft, that uh, our group, our EAMA Open Science Group, had, would have the aim to provide clear added value to and reflect the specific perspectives, experiences, and needs of research managers, managers and administrators on open science. The remit should be to exchange best practice, provide tools, and connect with other networks relevant to open science, e.g. Uh, the Yama Alien Group um, and other Yama activities, such as in training. Um, and we would focus our activities on specific aspects of these eight open science ambitions. 
And you know, we came up with a few that um, we already could identify open science and IP. We could have an event on uh, collaboration on best practices in research evaluation, the, our um, activities in CRM, in training, yeah, certification of uh, managers, research managers. Um, best practices such, the establish, such as the establishment of a virtual open science office at the University of Kent, or um, an open science roadmap at URAC. Um, and we can further discuss how to prioritize these eight um, ambitions and further events in the fall. Um, and we would like to uh, point out that we are very open here among YAMA members for your active participation. Uh, we have a core team, so I'm, I'm basically the one that wrote this draft remit, but a lot of other people were involved. Jan Anderson, Simon Kerridge, John Donovan, Wagner Lai, and uh, also uh, in the conference, um, Elise, who I think is also with us today. Um, and so basically we have set up a virtual group on the uh, Yama intranet where you can participate in the discussion. But I also found out that actually in this group, you, uh, I didn't manage to upload this document that I've been working on. Um, so I actually, um, put this document, which is about, you know, what should the remit of this group be. Uh, I also put it on uh, Google Docs, and it should be, if you have the link in the presentation, you should be able to access it. Um, so feel free also to put your comments there in uh, the track change mode. So we really invite you um, to help us shape the EAMA activities on open science. So that was the message that I wanted to bring across. Um, so let me just check um, whether we've covered everything. I think we did. Um, Johan has to leave in five minutes. Is there, or is there any final question to uh, Johan, Sally, or myself? In I don't see any. So uh, in this case, I think we managed uh, to discuss a lot of pertinent issues. Uh, we are not, you know, we, I don't think it's far too early to declare victory on open access. Uh, some people you like now to concentrate also on some of the other eight ambition of the commission, but we are not through with open access yet. So uh, there still needs to be hard work, you know, and uh, if we talk to open access experts, a lot of them you know, say, oh, it should all be moving a lot faster, but it's really hard work to get it done. Um, so thanks from my side to both our speakers, but also all of you who uh, sacrificed their time to attend. And as I've said, uh, feel free to get in touch with us for the group, for any input that you have, for any questions. And um, that's it from my side. Um, Ah, yeah, also to um, thank, of course, Maria and Johanna from the Yama Secretariat for helping us uh, set up the event. Johan and Sally, do you have any uh, final comments? No, okay. just... Go ahead. I was gonna say, we'll, we'll send the, the slides and the summary sheet and please feel contact, uh, free to contact us. Yes, and please implement the rights retention policy in your institution. Yes. <laughs> Very good. Thanks a lot. And then have a nice rest of the day. And goodbye from um, our side. Good so night. I'm going to close Thank the meeting. Goodbye. Thank you. Bye bye.